Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NASDAQ Dorsa Right podcast for the week ending on September 27th. Uh, my name is Ian Saunders, and uh, joined once again here by Miles Clark. Miles, good, good, to, good to be back. Hey, Ian. Yeah, it's been a, been a bit since I've been on, but uh, always nice to be here. Yeah, it's uh, you've been doing a lot of traveling. I have, it's, yeah. It's been good. You've been on both sides of the country. They call me Mr. Worldwide. They they do. That is your nickname here on the office. This is actually a, a toupee. Miles is actually bald there for trying to imitate Pitbull. Um, <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be funny if I were bald? Right, right. Um, Just fireball. But, <laughs> but no, you were, uh, you. We, we were both out of Future Proof two yeah. weeks ago. Um, it's a good conference um, out there in California, sunny, sunny Huntington Beach. Um, nice area to, to be in. Um, and a lo- lot of good conversations with advisors I know that we were having out there. Um, I wish we had the relative strength o meter here that we could show everybody on the podcast. Yeah, just put it right here, plop it down, exactly. the relatively strongest. So we had, for those of you who weren't at Future Proof, which is probably some of you who are who are listening, we had a really cool, it was like an arm wrestling contest, relative strength deal that, you know, you went up to and you, and you had an arm wrestling contest uh, against. And if you were in the top portion, uh, you were pretty strong. Yeah. I was not. But... Yeah, you weren't arm wrestling Miles or I. Let's yeah. just get to make that clear. You're arm wrestling a machine, and that machine was rough. Like, really it strong. Was, it was hard. I barely got a four. Um, so out of the score from zero to six, barely got a four. So I made it in the portfolio, thankfully, but uh, bar- yeah. bar- barely got there. We only had two in the fifth on where I where I was. <laughs> we had two people that uh, two people that like sent it all the way over. Um, one guy, if, if he is listening, he he told us he hadn't lost on an arm wrestling match in fifteen years. So. Uh, that machine was made for him, I think. Um, but it was a it, it was a great event. Um, and then you were up in uh, you up in New York as well earlier this week uh, with some more clients, right? So, I was, yeah, yeah. It was uh, super fun. Nice to get up. Nice to get up there. Always nice to be in New York, but uh, it was uh, trafficy. So I think I prefer the the speed of Richmond a little bit more. But uh, you know, New York never turned it down. Yeah, no, got myself a New York slice. There you right go. while I was up there. There you go. There you <laughs> so, go. It's probably a little bit better than slices here around Richmond, probably. Um, but yeah, it's good to good. Always good to be out and good to good to get in front of clients. Um, we'll be doing more of that this fall. We got some got some events and stuff coming up, so um, definitely be sure to to reach out to us or check things out. We might be coming coming to a city near you soon. Uh, All right, enough plugs. All enough right. plugs. Um, let's talk about let's, stocks. Let's go into stocks or indices. Yeah. So um, while you were doing all your traveling miles, don't know if you saw um, the S and P five hundred hit a few all time highs. Did it? Um, it did. It's hit three all-time highs over the course of the past week, heading into movement today. So we're recording this on Thursday. Um, podcast is going to come out on Friday morning. Um, I think just because we're doing the podcast, we're currently at another all-time high. Right. So if we if we closed right here, it's about three thirty in the afternoon, thirty minutes till cl- till market close. Um, it would notch a, f- a fourth all-time high over the past week. Um, which would be the 42nd all-time high for the S and P so far this year. How's that stand in in relation to his, historical averages? Uh, last year we had zero. Oh, okay. Um, which makes sense. which wouldn't it makes sense, but I had to do that. I was like, really? We didn't, but we didn't hit the new all time high in the S and P until this year after last week's or last year's improvement. We hit one in twenty twenty two. Right. Do you remember the, what day that was? Probably the first. Literally the very first trading day of twenty twenty two was the an all time high. Um, we hit seventy one in twenty twenty one. So that was a lot, the most since nineteen ninety five, I believe. So we've seen other periods. Forty honestly isn't that it's a lot, but right. it's not abnormal. Um, when we see years of a lot of consecutive, when the market's just at highs and slowly ticking higher, you're going to get a lot of these all-time highs. Right. And just they tend to kind of- after day after day. Right. They'll occur in clusters. You'll get three or four in a row, a few off, three or four in a row, a few off. Um, but these periods are not abnormal. The market's not abnormal to make, make new highs, obviously. Um, one thing that we did see that was pretty interesting is is- 2013, we saw, I think it was 45 all-time highs in 2013. We had not seen an all-time high since 2007 prior to that. So we right. went through a five-year stretch with no all-time highs after the 2008 bear market environment. Um, and then we started off with 45. We get a bear market last year. We're currently at 42. Mm. And then that 2013 through 2021 saw at least a few all-time highs printed Actually, at least ten all-time highs printed in at some point in every year. Um, Making many a year, call here. Many years saw many more, but I mean, I don't know if I'm ready to make the call of eight <laughs> consecutive years of all-time highs. But you do see these happen in clusters, right? I right. think is an important thing to note. And the fact that we saw a bear market in 2023, and we were this quick to another 40 40 bagger <laughs> from, right. from an all-time high, it's pretty it's pretty quick. 
Um, so we'll we'll see if we can continue out with clusters for moving forward. But at least that's that's what's tended to happen historically, right? Yeah, and one thing I noticed from that chart that you threw in, and we'll we'll throw it on the screen now. Yeah. But I mean, you go through periods of you know instances or or, or elongated periods without all all time highs too, right? So you they kind of cluster, and that makes sense, right? You saw like two thousand, you had one, and then you had the dot com bubble burst. Of course, then you got a couple in 2007, then you had clusters of years because of these massive downside moves that you're seeing when, um, you know, you have these big retreats. So I would say from 2022, just having one, really not having any in 2023, it's pretty, pretty quick. Yeah, and, and we didn't see as deep of a drawdown. Yeah, it yeah, wasn't as bad of a bear market in 2023 as certainly as we saw in 2007 or as we saw in 2001, right? right. So I think that's why, yes, right? I mean, yes. you saw it go down so much more. So it obviously is going to take longer to come back, but still, I mean, the data is what it is. They, they do tend to happen in clusters. Um, we'll see what plays out kind of moving forward from here. But I mean, back above 5,700 or back above um, now above 5,700 for the first time, I mean, is is I think indicative. So the, the title of the piece that we put in the report yesterday was reasons to sell um, a little bit of tongue in cheek because <laughs> we, we have another chart beneath it that runs through all the different potential negative catalysts that could be. We just we threw 18. I think it was on there. Um, just negative news headlines that might have affected market moves if if you were thinking about it in the moment. Right. It's a lot of potential negatives as we look out over the next few months, six months, year. I mean, you got, we're not going to talk about the election. We're nope. not getting political on here, but that yeah. some people might view that as a negative catalyst right. on, on both sides of the aisle. Um, you could have the, I mean, there's a lot of geopolitical conflicts going on. The Fed lowering interest rates is certainly, I mean, it's where it all time highs now. What that? happens moving forward? Yeah. Are they lowering for a reason that we don't know? Like, who knows? Right. A lot of stuff that could happen. But that reason to sell, I mean, the market just continues over time. You see corrections and pullbacks, but it continues going up to the right. And we're not like super extended right no. now. It's a pretty good looking technical picture. Yeah, I'd say. And, and that kind of brings it full circle, maybe to a broader point that, that, that we preach all the time, right? Which is there are always reasons to sell. There right. are always... Uh, headlines, right? Because in order to garner clicks, people are negative, right? And so right. nobody wants to be the guy who says, markets are going to go up this year, right? Yeah. Like that's not special. That's not making a call. That's not <laughs> differentiating yourself from the next guy who says, hey, like if this happens, the markets are down 40%. Like people click on that, right? So the point is, is that there's always going to be reasons to sell. Yeah. There's always going to be negative headlines. And so, you know, finding ways in this case, plugging Dorsey Wright stuff, um, <laughs> you know, it, there's it, finding ways to kind of cut through that noise, cut through those headlines, certainly a help. Yeah, yeah. fear is not a reason to sell. Exactly. Yeah, right. that, I think that's the the biggest point. I mean, there's well, always there's always going to be stuff out there. But to you, Dorsey Wright, I mean, we regardless of how you use our stuff, um, or if you use our stuff, but our stuff's the process, right? Right. We're 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 we're, we're pitching a process. Whether you use ETFs, funds, website, just listen to the podcast. We process oriented stuff, right? Cover up the name, objective reasons, up or down. What, what can we look at moving forward? Right. Um, and, and it's just that process is, I mean, it certainly might be reasons to sell, but it's a sell process, right? You want right. to have something in place ahead of time. So you're prepared on what to do when something happens. Right. And you're not just reading the headline that scares you, right? Exactly. You're, you're actually saying, okay, well, this is a legitimate issue that that is actually showing in the price that we're seeing right right yeah just kind of we're we're following the trends and let the trends kind of play out as they are and one of the trends that has been playing out recently um has been some some interesting movement in the dollar so right. so we talked at a little bit in last week's podcast i think trevor and i talked at the tail end we talked a lot about breadth improvement and good stuff that was happening from the rate cuts and we saw that play out with all-time highs um on the on the, the negative side i guess we're just lower moving side has been the dollar. The right. dollar saw sharp downward movement after the rate cuts last week. Um, and that movement, at least at the time of this recording, we saw a little bit of a, a step lower in the, on Thursday afternoon trading for the dollar. Um, not substantial from like a PNF chart perspective, but just looking at the daily movement, it was a, a big move lower. That 100 level for the dollar is a pretty important point, it seems. Um, I mean, it just sounds important, right? right. Yep. Um, but it, it, Definitely, if we see some further, it's kind of the bottom of the range that we've been in um, throughout throughout the the past year, 18, 20, almost, yeah, year plus, 18 months, let's say. Um, and if we see a break beneath that level, I mean, that, that could have some pretty interesting effects for other asset classes moving forward. Yeah, I've actually, I'd actually have a question for you. So, you know, we have historically said the dollar is one that tends to trend, right? You see signals leading to consecutive signals, trends leading to maybe more trends. We haven't really seen that over the course of the last, 
you know, like you said, about two years or so. Now, how do you, I'm not going to go making trades on the dollar or anything, but what do you think is at this point more significant, holding that 100 level or, you know, kind of moving lower, changing trends or returning to a buy signal? Like, how would you read where we are, right? Like you see this kind of decline, you see rates fall, right? So the dollar isn't as attractive from an international perspective uh, as, as kind of rates are coming down. So there isn't that tailwind from maybe a fundamental perspective, but how are you reading this chart? Like, are you looking for a reversal back up? Like, is that confirmation or like, what are you looking at for this specific instance? Yeah. I mean, so the way the, the way that we're, we use the dollar and for a lot of different ways from like a, maybe more of like an indication perspective on what to look toward. Um, we've also run some pieces using it as literally an indicator for, are you going to, based upon the trend of the dollar, are you going to be, you invest in unhedged or hedged developed international equities? Um, that obviously worked out very well because we got multiple consecutive signals for several years prior. I think literally we were standing on stage a year ago um, a, a year ago last week in, in Vegas at our annual sim symposium, um, talking about how well the dollar trends. Yes. And then that ended the streak right there. Right. Um, with that, that buy signal we got in August, end of August of last year, <laughs> and it rattled off to, to just go from, move forward from there. But I think the interesting point, we also started coming out with that piece around the same time. And when you look at the movement sense for the dollar, we had that buy signal, we got two consecutive sells, then we got two consecutive buys, and now we're back to a sell. So if you did just follow the trends, even though they are choppier, it still worked out better than if you didn't take those trend changes for that dollar movement. Because even though it's not the, the magnitude of the excess returns, I guess, wasn't as great it was still, there were still excess returns, if right. that makes sense. So yeah, it's just been sense. more muted um, alpha, I guess, right. from from using the, the dollar trends, but it's still been beneficial. Um, so I mean, to take that for what you will. Is it going to be beneficial moving forward? Probably because I just said it, maybe not. But um, but I, I, I'm honestly just looking at that 100 level more. I think we right. just kind of, we, we let the trends play out as they will. Um, the consistency is definitely something you look for. And I think we, looking where the, the chart is helpful because it has been so consistent over time, right? Even if it hasn't been as consistent over the past year. Um, and so that hundred level, I mean, you look past that hundred level, clear support at that hundred level from July of last year, you're looking down at 9550 for further support, right? It's a big drop. It is a big drop. And, but we weren't there that long ago. I mean, we were there in 2021, 2022. You look historically, we've been lower than that for longer periods of time. I mean, you go back in the 2011, 2013, we got down to 73 in 2011, right? So we've been significantly lower over the past decade than the current level we are now. So if we break through that 100 level, not saying we're going to fall back to 73, right? but there is room to move to the downside. Well, and, and too, when you look at these established ranges in the in the near term, like buyers or bulls there are going to be very, very keen to defend those levels, right? right? So if you kind of have a breach of that, I won't say, you know, you're not going to fall straight down, just like you said, but you are going to run into those instances where, you know, it's a little bit of uncharted territory and there's some maybe confusing price action around that level as, as, as the battle with supply and demand plays out, you know, because you did violate this massive level of, of support before. So just keep that in mind. Now, talking about areas that are impacted by the dollar, right? Internationally, we've seen a lot of action over the last week. Yeah, we have. We've seen, I mean, when you're looking at movement for the dollar, we talked about currency hedged and developed equities. Most of the time, people are going to be looking at the dollar towards towards like developed market catalysts. Right. It's not emerging markets have a lot more stuff going on. Right. Um, and we don't they're not typically as helpful on the emerging market side for movement from the dollar. Um, so we've seen haven't seen a ton of movement from developed markets because we just haven't broken through that level. Maybe right. 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 For the dollar yet. We are seeing a lot of improvement from emerging markets, and that's because China is. Um, at least near term back, shall we say? Um, we don't want to <laughs> jinx anything here, but I mean, we're looking at like over the past three days, China has moved from. They're looking at the broader like MCHI, I share China representative. Um, you're bouncing off a support level at, at 40, 40 dot fifty, um, and then you're we're all up at fifty bucks with today's move. That's a massive move. We're up eight percent at the time of this recording on Thursday. We've gotten two consecutive big stimulus moves from China, the Chinese government this week. Um, David put some nice pieces in the report, kind of outlining 
uh, earlier this week on like what those were. We got more today. People were saying, is that enough? And China said, we heard that. You want more? We'll <laughs> get all the you. money. Printer. So now it's like, where else are they going to keep going? Right. <laughs> right. Um, and, and that's definitely paying, paying dividends. We're new 52 uh, week highs for, for MCHI and a lot of their Chinese equity representatives. Now, I asked you the same question I asked you on the U.S. dollar. What are you looking for? Because at this point, I guess we would have said this a couple of days ago when we saw the first 8% move, like you would say, well, I guess you kind of missed the move, right? But like now we're up another 8% intraday yep. today. What do you do, right? We are historically, you and I were talking about before the pod, we are possibly the most overbought. 240% overbought at the time of this recording. Right. So like to put that in context, going back, we have never seen probably um, on that, an end of week basis on an end of week basis yeah. uh, we've never seen a level that high before now is it possible that we saw that intra week yes it, it could it we is. reverse down tomorrow and get back to right yeah but how do you play very fast moves like this like what do you do now now uh M mchi has a, a a fund score above 3.0 so like technically probably speaking, gonna be before after today's move 3.97 right right like probably it's it's technically actionable now, but we are heavily overbought. So how do you navigate this territory from from your side of things? Yeah, I think that China China moves quick. Right, right. And it, it, this is nothing new. Right. right, it's been very quick to the upside, quick to the downside. Unfortunately, recently it's been a lot more quicker moving to the downside. Um, but you're looking at a current chart level of fifty, all time high for NCHI was ninety seven in twenty twenty one. So like if you're just looking back at, at historic, I mean we were down, we've been down a lot over right. the past couple of years. So it has a lot of room to run. I'm not saying it's going to hit $97 on Friday, but it but, <laughs> that um, would be pretty crazy. <laughs> that would be pretty crazy. Um, but I think you, breaking through to that $50 mark um, matches a support level dating back to March and April of 2023. And that was a pretty notable support level that it we got to once in March, uh, twice in March, once in April, almost got back to there in July of 2023. And then fell another step lower back right. down into the, the, the low 30s. Um, breaking through that point, and especially breaking through 55 to the upside that we got to at the beginning of 2023, I mean, that level, if you're just looking back at that $50 mark over the past couple of years, it's been very notable. So if we're able to continue that improvement higher, you want consistency, of right? Course. Yep. I mean, that's what you want. Would I be buying in CHI at $50 today? Maybe not, right? I, I, I If you, you might be able to get a better price tomorrow. Right, um, right. Right. If it's 240 percent overbought we'll see what happens tomorrow um but you want consistent we only on one buy signal right now it just bumped up against its trend line passed a test of its trend line went up gave a buy signal it's up another 15 percent since that buy signal over the past three days but that one buy signal is not necessarily i mean you'd like to see a couple in there back right. to back you like to see more consistent improvement um big stems like that while they are frequent for more frequent for China versus maybe other areas, um, maybe you you might get a little bit more of an opportunity to buy on some of the more consistent movement too. Yeah, and I'll say like the international space is 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 um, or at least the emerging part of the international space is is pretty wide open from a relative strength perspective. I mean, there's there's parts of Europe that are are pretty strong. So emerging Europe, developed Europe, both of those are are pretty strong. But you look at like Latin America. That's been a poor performer, relatively speaking, on the uh, on the emerging front. So there is some kind of relative strength, I would say, up for grabs for China specifically, and, and that kind of Asia group there. So that's something that I'm I'm personally watching is how much of of long term relative strength, given that we see a pullback from China, you know, saying that we're so overbought. Uh, but saying that we're so overbought, we get a little bit of a pullback. How much of long term relative strength can can Asia grab? Yeah. Uh, on the on the international front. Right. I mean, so we look at like 42 country index representatives in a ranking um, prior to Thursday's move, prior to the 8 percent move we're seeing today. Um, China moved from 38 to 35 in those rankings. Right. So it was down near the bottom and then it jumped up a few spots. Highest level it's been at in 18 months with, at 35. So it's it's definitely improving. Um, but we haven't, to that consistency perspective, you need more consistent improvement if you're going to get more relative strength move, right? Right. And you're probably going to need a little bit more back and forth because that might create a common reversal that makes it easier to move higher moving forward, right? right. Um, so wouldn't be surprised to see it back off from that $50 mark before ultimately like pushing further higher, pushing higher through it um, would be the ultimate, obviously, end goal for those that are bullish on Chinese equities. Um, cool.
Yeah, I mean, I, we'll, we'll see how that shakes out. <laughs> we will. Yeah, and, and, and that'll be something that uh, probably won't be a, a deal over the next week, although we, we we're at 15% over the past week, so we'll see. It's we'll, possible. It's possible. We'll see what happens there. But that will probably, we'll probably have more time to talk about that in Q4. Yeah, I'd imagine. Yeah, end of the end of the quarter. I think it's been a pretty productive one for a lot of the a lot of the names we typically look at. Like we've already talked about S and P hitting hitting all time highs. The growth focused areas have not rolled over. Like I think we were concerned about to start the third quarter, kind of in that um, you know August kind of beginning of September type of deal. We were a bit concerned. We saw growth roll over a little bit. That hasn't really been the case. We've seen that kind of surge back. Value is also doing well. So, I, you know, there's a lot of areas in a traditionally weak part of the year, like September, like the third quarter. You know, there's a lot of, of, of good things occurring as we move into a traditionally strong period of the year, which right. is the fourth quarter. And I think Chuck had some, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to try to get at the exact stats because I'm, I'm not going to do them justice, but I hope this is directionally right. Um, Chuck had a, a stat that he was looking at that. September has had very bad years, but when it's strong, right. the rest of the year, I think, tends to be pretty strong, right. too. Um, and so, I mean, there's we see that from the election standpoint. You put a good piece in the report last week saying that for, the Q4 of election years are have been positive 75% of the time um, over the past 100 years. It's a pretty good hit rate. Yeah. Right. Um, we'll see what shakes out over October and, and kind of heading into that. But, um, it's yeah, there's there's. There's a lot of potential, I guess, that we could look toward. If you if you told me at the beginning of September that we we're going to be at all time highs at the end of the month, I would have been probably a little bit surprised. But then again, if you told me in January that we were going to hit 42 all time highs this year, I would have been pretty surprised too. And here we are, right? right? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, markets are moving, and and, and going back and, and briefly touching on that election piece, uh, you put it well a couple quarters ago, and when and when we when you put that piece together. But a lot of that stuff isn't necessarily who wins. We're not sitting here talking about Trump or no. Kamala. We don't want to open that whole can of can of worms, but. <laughs> Markets are concerned with uncertainty, yeah. right? And so when you don't know who's winning or you don't know you know, what policy is going to be coming into play over the next four years, that's when things can get a little bit dicey. But typically speaking, after the markets kind of digest who is winning or, or who has won, um, that uncertainty fades, right? And so markets can digest everything and then appropriately price that into the market. And move on. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so that's when, you know, you, you, when you have concern or uncertainty about what's going on that's when things can get a little bit dicey or, or hairy but yeah yeah that's typically not the case in the fourth quarter of an election year yeah we'll see i mean there's always there's always room for uncertainty but like right. i said there's a, it's always going to be reasons to sell so yeah. that's uh um yeah i, I think, think that uh that puts it well um so i think that wraps up most of what we're looking to looking to hit on at least i'm out of charts i don't have any more i got nothing cool. you do anything fun this weekend no no not not at all um yeah that's uh, trying to take uh, trying to take my dog out a little bit more. Uh, so that's what about you? Nothing. There we go. Both of us. Are Maybe going. we should find something to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna just uh, shoot me a text. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Uh, great. Well, hopefully you all are having a more exciting weekend than Miles and I. Uh, but thanks for tuning in and listening to us this week, and uh, we'll be back next week. Cool. See y'all later.